Thank you, ladies. That was beautiful. That was really, really nice. Thank you so much. I just want to welcome each of you here this morning. I want to welcome the visitors. I want to welcome those who are watching online. We didn't realize it, but there's actually a lot more people watching online than we thought. And probably especially on a day like today with all this snow. But welcome each of you. I, I pray that you will be blessed. You know, this is the last Sabbath of this year. And next Sabbath is going to be a little bit different. And uh, one of the things that's different, I've run this by the, the Board of Elders and also the pastor, and they very, were very gracious with me and going to allow me to do things a little different um, this coming year. We've been here for quite a while, ever since Kettle Falls has become a church. And in the past, it was different. It was different in that we had lots of young people. At one time, we had a choir that had 27 people singing. It was amazing. It was beautiful. And some of you have been around that long, and you remember that. And I thought of those days because we had, we had a, a church that was just full of young people, vibrant young people. It was wonderful. And I said at that time, I said, you know, this is, the, this is the high time for Kettle Falls Church. It'll never be like this again. And in fact, it hasn't. It's changed. Those young people, they moved away. They went to college. They got married. They're gone. But guess what? We have a whole big group of young people coming up. We have those same days coming. Now, at that time, all these people moved into the area and their kids were like 10 years old and above. We're going to get to enjoy this group even longer because these are younger. And what I would like to do for our Kettle Falls family is I would like to have a church service that is kid-oriented, okay? A little bit more kid-oriented. That's going to impact us as adults a little bit in that um, instead of having so much time for prayer and praise and that type of stuff, haven't got this entirely worked out. And for this next Sabbath, if you'll just call me during the week or at least by Friday evening, we're going we're gonna to put some of these things on this continuously loop slideshow thing and so you can read these things. We, don't, we won't have to have so much time for announcements and these other things. Uh, not that they're not important. We'll still be emphasizing some things that are important. Sometimes there will be things that we really need to mention, we really want to mention. And so we will still be doing it, but we'll cut down the time to a degree. And the purpose of that is, and so directly after Sabbath school, if these... If anybody, young or old, but especially children, play an instrument, come up front here, bring your instrument, and let's play with the song service. So we're going to have at least a three-song song service, okay? And um, the purpose, we just, we want to get our kids involved. We want to enjoy them while we can still enjoy them before they move away, okay? Uh, we're going to have a children's offering. Um, and it was will be going for, at least initially, uh, the board asked Marika and Christine, brother, I'm getting old, Marika and Sally and myself to decide where the offering is going to go to. For, so for now, um, it's going to go down to the, the Indian school down there in Arizona where to Holbrook. You can actually go on to the web and look up Holbrook Indian School and you can see a lot of the, of the things that's happening there and the needs that are happening. They have big needs and this is for children. They have needs for food. That's pretty basic. Um, tuition there is only $81 a month 
and a lot of them can't even afford $81 a month. So it's going for, for uh, they have a great need for worthy student money, but they also have a great need for food. And so for the first at least six months, we're going to, to uh, be sending our children's offering there. Uh, we'll look at it again as time goes. Uh, there, there was another a mission in Africa that was brought up, an orphanage there, and maybe after, the first six, after this, uh, we will be sending the money there, and, and uh, that will be decided later. But anyway, so if you have a prayer request, you have a praise, you have an announcement, you all be looking at the bulletin. Bob does a really great job of getting everything in there. And we'll put it on this, this loop show. I assume it's going, yeah. And uh, that way we'll have more time for singing and other things, okay? Um, this is a little bit different. We may not continue. If it uh, becomes too objectionable, we'll do something different. But it's just an idea that we're going to start with. So that starts next Sabbath. So call me if you have things that we need to put on this, all right? Okay. Let's ask the Lord's blessing as, as we begin this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we need your Holy Spirit. I need your Holy Spirit. That the words that I say will become, come from you and not from myself because I misspeak so often. So I just ask your special blessing. We've already asked, and I know we will receive. So thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, Thanksgiving is the most traveled holiday of the season. You might think differently if you were at the airport uh, yesterday. But uh, Thanksgiving is the most traveled holiday of the year. But Christmas is the most expensive holiday of the year. There are some people who they spend so much for Christmas, it takes them the whole next year to pay it off. Miserable. Actually, in 2019 was the record-breaking year. There was a little over $1 trillion that was spent on Christmas gifts and all that comes with Christmas. Well, then COVID came in 2020. The, it, the spending was down, and this year it was expended, ex, expected to be about the same as last year which was $850 billion, still a lot of money. The season is supposed to be about Jesus and his gift to us. That is the origin of Christmas, even though the date, obviously, as we know, is not December. It was actually in the spring of the year at the time of the Passover. At the time of Jesus' birth, Jerusalem was crowded to the degree that, as we know the story, Joseph and Mary could only find room in a stable. Luke tells us that Caesar Augustus also used this same period of time um, for taxation. Everybody was supposed to go back to the city of their origin uh, for the purpose of taxation. And so probably because of the taxation and also the Passover, Jerusalem may have been more crowded than it normally even was. During Passover and these other feasts of the year, all Jewish males were to go to Jerusalem. And the Passover was one of those religious festivals, but the Passover was the most important of all these festivals. The Passover was to celebrate the children of Israel, their deliverance from Egypt. And during this feast, the feast of the Passover, every family offered a lamb. They offered this lamb as a sacrifice, because you remember back in Egypt there, before they left Egypt, before that last night, they were supposed to paint the blood of the lamb on the sides of the door and over the top of the door. And that way, they were delivered from the destroying angel that, that destroyed the firstborn. So there was a lamb that was involved. There was about two million people in Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. And because of these two million people, there was a need for about 500,000 lambs. That is a lot of lambs. 
Now, these were not just ordinary lambs. They had to be perfect lambs. They had to be examined by the priests. They had to be declared perfect. And interestingly enough, these lambs had to be born within a five-mile circumference of the city of Jerusalem. These lambs, they were bred, they were raised for a special purpose, and this was big business. These lambs were so very special that when they were born, the shepherd or whoever was out there attending them, and they attended them, these were special lambs, they were born, they were inspected, they were dried off, and get this, they were wrapped in swaddling cloths, and they were laid in a stone manger. These were special lambs. The Passover occurred during the first month of the Jewish year, which was the month of Ahib. On the 10th day of that month, the family, they would go to the market, and they would choose their lamb. That little lamb would come home with the family, and they would spend time with the family for the next four days. And of course, especially the children, they would bond with this lamb. And then on the 14th day of the month, the lamb was sacrificed. Even the hour of the sacrifice was specified. It was specified the lamb was slain at the ninth hour of the day. The ninth hour of the day back then was our three o'clock. And you remember that that was the day, Passover day, and the time of the day that our Passover lamb, Jesus, died. Now, raising lambs was big business. These shepherds might have not been the simple farm folk that they're so often made out to be. These may have been educated entrepreneurs. These may have been people who could afford to buy and own scrolls. They could afford to read these scrolls of the prophets. Why would not the Jewish people, of all people, be looking forward to the coming of the Messiah? Because of Adam and Eve's sin, they had inherited this sinful nature. Adam and Eve had a choice, but their descendants and us, we have no choice. We've been born into this mess, and we have the hope of Redeemer. The children of Israel, they had this hope. They had the promise that the Savior was going to be born unto them. The promise was first given in Genesis 3, verse 15, where God said that he was going to put enmity between Satan and his people, that Satan's would bruise God's people, but Satan's head was going to be crushed. That promise was played out in that very first sacrifice, probably outside the garden gate, the symbolism of the lamb that was sacrificed. Every subsequent sacrifice was to point God's people to him. God taught his people there in the children of Israel as they went out there in the desert for those 40 years. All the symbolism of the sacrifice, all those feasts, all those, all those services that the children of Israel went through, they were all to point Jesus as symbolic as their Redeemer, as their Savior. There's over 300 prophecies of Jesus' birth and ministry. Balaam gave a prophecy. I like this one. Uh, it's found in Numbers 24, 17. It says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. So as it turns out, the Christmas star is the most Jewish thing there ever was. For millennia, the coming of the Messiah had been associated with the appearance of a star. Another prophecy is found in Genesis 49.10, and it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. 
and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The scepter had essentially departed from Israel. The Romans had taken over the world government in 63 BC. And so the waning power of Israel testified that the coming of the Messiah was close at hand. The Jewish people were suppressed by the Romans, and for the most part, the clashes between the Jews and the Romans was averted by the local client king. These were uh, skillful politicians. The one that we know his name of most readily was Herod the Great. And so these local client kings, through their skill, most often, the Jews were able to practice their religion quite freely. Micah 5 verse 2 tells us where Jesus was to be born. But thou, Bethlehem, or Freyta, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Well, that's where Jesus was supposed to be born, but the Bible also tells when Jesus was going to be born. And that prophecy is found in Daniel 9, 9, verses 24 through 27. That prophecy is, as we know, the 2300 days. And if you look at that prophecy, it would seem that the Jews should have been able to calculate very close when Jesus was going to be born. The beginning of that prophecy was in 457 B.C. And Jesus' ministry is going to begin at the end of 69 weeks. So 69 times 7, 7 days in a week, is 483. So you take 457, add 483 to it, and you come to 27 A.D. That's when Jesus began his ministry. Now, a Jew was not considered an adult and ready for his ministry until age 30. So, if you take the beginning of his ministry of 27 AD, you subtract 30 from that, Jesus was prophesied to be born in 4 BC. And that is when he was born. Why would not the Jews, who had been urgently looking for the Messiah, Why did they miss Jesus' birth? Zacharias, the priest, the father of John the Baptist, as he ministered at the altar, he was told the nearness of Jesus' coming because he was told who his son would be. His son was Jesus' forerunner. And because of Zacharias' lack of faith, he was struck dumb. He was struck dumb and he did not speak again until his son was born. When his son was born, there was the miracle of him being able to speak again. Also, prophecy was given and telling of what Jesus would do. This was done in Jerusalem. This was a big deal where a priest who had been numb, dumb, excuse me, dumb and numb, for nine months, and now he miraculously could speak again. This is, this is big stuff. It went all over Jerusalem. John was only six months, excuse me, six months older than Jesus. And in a short six months, the people forgot it all. They totally forgot. We're told that the heavenly messengers were amazed at the indifference of the people that God had specifically chosen as the lineage. They should have been there to witness this sacred truth and privilege. The shepherds, the wise men from the east, they were looking for a Messiah. They recognized him. They welcomed him. They worshiped him. Jesus was taken to the temple for his dedication. And Simeon and Anna the prophetess 
they both recognize Jesus as the heaven-sent Messiah. It seems unthinkable that the rest of Israel, God's especially chosen people, were not watching and ready to welcome the Savior of the world because Jesus was their only hope out of the fatal mess that they had found themselves in ever since the fall in Eden. Jesus' first coming was prophesied. Most missed it. Jesus' life and ministry were prophesied, but most did not recognize him as their truly heaven-sent Messiah. But they were given a second chance. Acts 6, verse 7 and 8, And the word of the Lord increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So those who had been Jesus' most bitter enemies, they were converted, and they recognized and accepted Jesus as their Messiah. But there is no second chance for those who are not watching and waiting for Jesus' second coming. Those folks back there, they got a second chance. We will not. Jesus' second coming is even more clearly prophesied. Are we watching? Are we preparing? If you would, I'd like to take you to take your Bibles and turn to Joel chapter 2. I would like you to look at these verses with me. Joel chapter 2, there it's kind of the beginning of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. If you get to Amos, Obadiah, you've passed it up. Joel chapter 2. We're going to begin with verse 1. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Skip down to verse 3. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. I find that an interesting verse. What is this garden of Eden before them and a desolate wilderness behind them? Whatever it is, nobody's going to escape it. The heavenly Eden is what is the Garden of Eden before them. It's the heavenly land that's before them and the destroyed earth after Jesus comes that is behind them. We have two choices. And the Bible says here in Joel verse 3, nobody is going to escape it. Look at verse 11. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and terrible, and who can abide it? Here's our preparation. Our preparation is found in verses 12 through 17. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, Gather the babies, verse 17. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore they should they say among the people, Where is their God? Joel gave this plea to us, this warning to us as last day people. Get ready get ready, get ready. And then Joel tells us of the signs of Jesus' second coming. Skip down to verse 30 
and 31. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon turned into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Jesus gave us these very same signs of his coming. He confirmed Joel's prophecy and is found in Matthew 24 through 29. And that passage says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, what is that? That was the dark ages, right? The middle ages, the dark ages, the tribulation of those days. Right after that shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, very next verse, and then shall appear the, son of the, this, appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. It seems to indicate, and we've always thought it, that after those signs, Jesus was on his way. Acts 2, 20 and 21, same thing. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Folks, these signs are so old, they can't be called a sign. What they can tell us is that Jesus' coming is long overdue. That's what they will tell us. May 19 of 1780, the prophecy of the dark day was fulfilled. That was the day the sun refused to shine and the moon, the moon appeared as blood. 1780. November 12 through 13, that night, 1833, was the falling of the stars. Along with the sign of the sun, moon, and stars, Revelation 6, 12 tells us, associated with these, there was going to be a great earthquake. It says, there was a great earthquake, the sun became a black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. This earthquake actually occurred before the sign in the sun, moon, and stars. It occurred clear back in 1755, and it was the most terrible earthquake that has ever been recorded. Its extent was more than four million square miles. This was enormous. These signs, all of them, were fulfilled as much as 165 years ago. These are old signs. But the Bible and Joel and Jesus himself said that these were signs of the end. But today, we are experiencing signs that tell us that Jesus is coming soon. How soon? We don't know how soon, but it is soon. The COVID crisis has united the world as has never been before. The whole world has responded upon Q just as those leaders of darkness had hoped that we would. We've done it. COVID has united the world in fear. They've united us in suspicion and hatred that has never been before occurred. There used to be two parties here, Democrats, Republicans. They were different parties. They didn't agree on everything, but they never hated each other like they do now. The hatred is so intense. The vaccinated blame the unvaccinated. They blame the others, others, each other, for the sickness and the death that has occurred, that has occurred because of this crisis. Reason has become extinct. Our Constitution has become meaningless, or I should say, I'll back up, it is becoming meaningless. Our flag has become meaningless. Our flag used to only be lowered half mass for the death of a president. Now, our flag can fly at half mass for any many meaningless civil violence. In Australia, people tested COVID, positive for COVID, are taken to COVID camps and they are forced to live there. In Peru and other countries, vaccinations are mandatory mandatory for those who want the privilege of buying and selling, the privilege of being in public. In Germany, the malls are split up for the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. Here in America, thousands 
and thousands of people have lost their jobs for refusing to be being vaccinated. Civil rest is unmanageable. You remember not that long ago what was happening in, the, in, our, in our cities, in Portland, Seattle, other places. Civil rest is unmanageable. I don't listen to the radio hardly at ever because uh, I can't get it in. Uh, but just two days ago, I flipped it on to our local station, which is now overrun by the one in, in Spokane. And they were talking there about what was happening in our cities. And they were talking about the civil rest that was becoming unmanageable. And they were actually saying that there was, there was a huge risk of civil war once again happening in our cities. We're told that that would happen. It's found in manuscript 114, written clear back in 1889, 1899, where she says that there will be civil wars in the cities of America, India, China, and Russia. Well, folks, this is just the COVID issue. We have yet to see what it's going to be like with the Sabbath Sunday issue. What will this new year hold? The Sunday Sabbath issue is, well, not the issue, but the Sunday Sabbath is something that the Pope is promoting as his solution for climate change. And he is scheduled to have a meeting here very soon. We're told that these last movements are going to be rapid ones, and COVID has proved how quickly things can happen. When the Sunday law comes, it's going to happen so fast that you are not going to be able to catch your breath. I'd like to read to you something from Heavenly Places, page 347. There is an earnest work of preparation to be done by Seventh-day Adventists if they would stand firm in the trying experience just before them. If they remain true to God and in the confusion and temptation of the last days, they must seek the Lord in humility of heart for wisdom to resist the deceptions of the enemy. Ever are we to keep in mind the solemn thought of the Lord's soon return. In view of this, to recognize the individual work that is to be done. Through the aid of the Holy Spirit, we are to resist natural inclinations and tendencies to wrong, weed out of the life every unchristlike element. Thus, we shall prepare our hearts for the reception of God's blessing, which will impart to us grace and bring us into harmony with the faith of Jesus. For this work of preparation, great advantage has been granted to this people. In light bestowed, in messages of warning and instruction sent through the agency of the Spirit of God. We have the Bible. We have past history. We have current events. We have the spirit of prophecy. We have, we have more information available to us than those people at Jesus' birth ever had. How can we be without excuse? Here's a promise and an admonition. We know this well. It's Isaiah 55, 6. Seek ye the Lord while he is, may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. This is our day. Our daily lives, daily lives need to witness to the faith that we profess. I want to read you in closing just two more quotes. Sorry to read. They're both from the book early writings. Time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? Then I was pointed to the earth and saw that there would have to be a getting ready among those who have of, of late embraced the third angel's message. Said the angel, get ready, get ready, get ready. You will have to die a greater death to the world than you have yet died. I saw that there was a great work to do for them, but little time in which to do it. I saw that God's people are on, are on enchanted ground and that some have nearly lost all sense of the shortness of time and the worth of the soul. That's not the worth of just other people's soul. That's our own also. Last one, page 66 again. Will you shun the last plagues, last seven plagues? 
Will you go to glory and enjoy all that God has prepared for those who love him and are willing to suffer for his sake? If so, you must die that you may live. Get ready, get ready, get ready. You must have a greater preparation that you now have. Sacrifice all to God. Lay all upon his altar, self, property, and all, a living sacrifice. It will take all to enter glory. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where no thief can approach or rest corrupt. You must be partakers of Christ's sufferings if you would be partakers with him in his glory hereafter. I know last Sabbath we ended with the song, page 140, Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne. And it speaks of Jesus' sacrifice, the King of Heaven, who came here to this world to live and die so that we may live. And it seems like so often I forget that. But in this song, it says, O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. The last verse My heart shall rejoice, Lord Jesus, when thou comest and callest for me. So when Jesus comes and calls for us, truly, may we have found time and a place in our heart for Jesus. If you would sing with me hymn number 140. Think of all the verse, I mean, think of all the words of this song. It's a beautiful song. And it's a song for us today. Let's stand together as we sing.